In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love the way that this uh, chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel ends when Jesus asks the disciples, Have you understood all this? And they say, Yes. I have to imagine that actually what the disciples were, do- were, were doing were, Yes, we understand everything you're saying, Jesus. Right? <laughs> but happily... As the parables teach us, God has patience for our lack of understanding and lets us catch on as we go. In this morning's lessons from St. Matthew's Gospel and from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we celebrate God's prior and plural action. His prior action in our lives and his plural action in the world. Let's start with God's prior action, his prior grace. The Apostle John in one of his epistles says, We love God because God first loved us. Again and again, the biblical story teaches us that the initiative for love is entirely on God's part. The initiative for life is coming completely from God's end of the table. St. Paul says, While we were still sinners... The Messiah died for us. That is, when we couldn't, you know, when we were in a position of not having anything to trade, anything to negotiate with, anything to point to, to deserve a life with God, God gave it to us as a gift. And in St. Matthew's Gospel, we hear parables about landowners sending tenants to collect the rent from, or landowners sending sons to collect the rent from wicked tenants. Again, that's a pretty good uh, illustration of initiative, isn't it? Typically, tenants don't think to themselves, oh, my first priority of the month is to write this rent check and get it to the landlord, especially a wicked tenant, right? A wicked tenant would avoid every possible opportunity to write a check for the rent. And so the initiative, if any rent is going to be collected, right, is going to be at the initiative of the landowner. And the landowner sends the son. It is the landowner who initiates a relationship with the tenants, not the other way around. And by the way, what do fish know of the one holding the net that's pulling them out of the water, right? I mean, they, all they know is they're coming up into the boat. Typically speaking, fish do not jump into the boat in and of themselves. It takes someone catching them and hauling them aboard. The initiative is always with God. God, his action, his grace is prior to our own response. And in today's gospel, we have parables of seeking and finding and getting treasure. We seek for God because he first seeks us. We yearn for life, for true life, for life beyond what we can get or make for ourselves or see with our own eyes in the world before us because, precisely because, God yearns for us. His deepest desire is to give us his life as a gift. And he plants that longing in our hearts. It's a longing that's almost like a, it's like a compass needle suspended on a pin, right? That turns to the source of its magnetism. In the same way, God has implanted within our very hearts a desire to know him, a desire to have a life that is not our own, but which comes to us as a gift. In Psalm 42, verse 1 It says, as the deer longs for the water brooks, so my soul longs for you, O God. God, in a sense, what what that suggests is God makes us thirsty so that we will seek him in a parched land. And he wants us to find him. You know, the animals, they're able to smell out water, aren't they? And God has given us a nose to smell out the river of life, to smell out that source of living water with which God seeks to slake our thirst for his love in our lives. 
In this section of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which we read this morning, it says, it, it translates, God who searches the heart. Implied there is God, the one who searches the heart. But another way to translate the same Greek would be to say, God, the searcher of hearts, knows the spirit, right? Because he searches the heart of God himself. God is a searcher of hearts. So in these parables of the farmer and the merchant, God is inviting us to act like he does. He's inviting us to imitate him, to do what he has already done for us, to seek him, to seek him. We come to the parables needing to understand that we are the pearl first. If you walk away from this sermon with nothing else this morning, walk away with the knowledge that you are God's treasure. You are the prize for which he gave everything. You are the pearl which he gave his own son to obtain. As John says in that much repeated verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gives his best to obtain us. We are the pearl first. We are the found pearl, the salvaged treasure in the field for whom God has given his best, his all. And now we are invited to seek him and value his mercy and love similarly to make God our world. God has given his son for the world, and now we are called to make God our world in the way that the farmer, when he uses the tre you know, he uses everything he has, he sells off everything he has in order to make that field his world. And since that's become his world, that's where he works, that's where he lives, right? The farmer, his fields are his world. And God, through these parables, invi is inviting us to make him our world, our kingdom, is the word Jesus uses. Our kingdom in whom we live and move and have our being, giving our best to him and selling off everything that is not him. Right? So remember, the farmer finds the treasure and then he sells everything else off. Right? So everything, not that treasure, that gets sold in order to get the treasure. We are called to sell off everything which is not God, to dispose of those attitudes, those death-dealing habits, those guilts and, and baggage from the past, to so sell it off. Stop carrying that baggage around with you one more foot. Sell it off. Sell it off so that you can gain what God wants to give to you his life and his love. God's prior action is also revealed in a second way through these parables. That is, who would hide found treasure in the first place? Right? And sometimes people are, are confused by the parable. They'll say, you know, it's like a guy, the kingdom is like a guy who he's farming in a, in a field and he finds a treasure and then he goes and he, then he hides the treasure again. You know, what gives? What is he doing? He find it? Why would he hide it after he found it? Okay, so we have to understand the, the, the context is that hiding treasure is a traditional and, very, and a classic rural gambit to hide assets from the tax man or bandits, right? Remember, you don't have First Bank of Galilee to stick your gold in. You know, you, you don't, you know, you have, when you bring in a crop, you have to put it in a, in a granary. I mean, the mice are stealing from you, let alone everybody else in the village, right? I mean, you know, that's the life that people lived, right? They didn't have a secure way to store their surplus goodies, right? So in, in a rural context, what did people do? They would take whatever, if they had surplus crops and they got a little bit of coin at the marketplace, they put that coin inside a little vessel of some sort, right? Seal it with a wax, you know, kind of a waxed, you know, uh, seal on the top and go and bury it somewhere. 
I mean, the whole, you know, re remember, I, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember there, the, there is still the stories about buried treasure, you know, right? Well, that, that comes from somewhere. It comes from the fact that the problem with burying your treasure is that there is a weakness in the plan. The weakness is if the person who buried it doesn't tell anyone else in their family where it is before they, you know, right? That, that's a problem. That's a problem. My, my great uncle Joe Metter, he was, uh, he, he lived, born, raised, lived and died in, the, in rural Kansas. And after he retired from the town newspaper, he was a typesetter from the day he was, he got a job at 16 in the type, being a typesetter for the newspaper. And he worked at that newspaper until he was 55. And then he retired and then it's like, what else am I gonna do in my life? So he started selling, this is way back, this is in the early 60s, he started selling ICA, Investment Company of America stock to farmers. And this was back in the mid days of the, in the Midwest when that was the, those were the years of fat and plenty in the rural Midwest, right? And so these farmers, they had lots of money, but, where were they, but they were all trained by the depression to stick it in the mattress, right? You didn't trust the banks. And so good old Uncle Joe, he, he was born and raised, he knew them all, he spoke their language, and he got them to invest in, you know, ICA stock. Well, he, tells, he told us a story one time, he went to a farmer who, you know, he, to invest, and the farmer said, okay, I'll tell you, just, uh, why don't you come over here, bring a shovel. And so the farmer takes him to a spot in his field, and they dig down, and they pull up a milk can. And then he pops the seal top off the, you know, one of those big milk cans, you know, that you said. And inside were just bundles of cash, right? That's where he put his life savings, were in milk cans. And so he took out $10,000 of cash from the milk can and gave it to my Uncle Joe. This is back in the early 60s. That was a lot of money back then. And he gave us, he said, okay, here, why don't you invest this for me? I mean, which and it's clearly not even like the whole of what was in the milk can, right? The problem was farmer, tight-lipped sort of guy, drops dead of a heart attack, right? And doesn't, never told his wife where he's buried all the milk cans. And so she's got this farm and she's absolutely penniless. And my Uncle Joe had the pleasure of coming and saying, this is 15 years on, and showing her how the money had grown. And so she actually had something to live on, right? So that was the weakness of the system of burying treasure. So that's what you see in the parable. So this guy, he's farming, he's a tenant farmer, and he finds a treasure that someone has left behind, right? And so what he does is he says, oh, and so he hides it again, right? And then that's when he sells off everything. So then instead of being a renter, he then owns the field and the treasure is now his, right? This is how finders keepers worked in Jesus's day, right? So the parable assumes, as I said, a previous tenant has left the treasure behind and it has now been discovered. So here's the point of the parable. This is why this is, the king, this is the kingdom point of the parable. God put the treasure, which is himself, where we can find it. That's the point. The treasure was found. God is like a sloppy farmer, a sloppy hider, if you will, who hides the treasure exactly where he knows the next guy's going to come through and find it. And he hides himself. That's the, that's, the, 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 that's the point of the joke. That's the punchline. The kingdom punchline. Because the point of the parable is that God wants to be found. He wants to be found. He puts his whispering, praying spirit of love deep inside of us where no one can take it away. That's where he has to hide it. And since this is this is me kind of working my end of the, my my angle on this on this parable, see why would God hide Himself in the first place? He hides Himself deep down inside of us so that no one can take Him away. He hides Himself in a place where only we can find Him. Only we can find Him. The Book of Deuteronomy says. Do not say to yourself, who shall go into heaven to find God for us? Or who shall cross the sea that we may bring his word hence? 
know God's word is near to you on your mouth and in your heart. God has hidden himself in plain sight inside of your heart, inside of your experiences, even inside of your worst mistakes. God has hidden himself there because he wants to be found precisely in those places. God wants to give good gifts to his children. He is like a loving parent who hides a gift precisely where the child will find it. You know, you see those commercials where, you know, somebody gets a car for Christmas and they walk out the front door and there's the car, right? That's how God hides himself, right? In a sense, with those with eyes to see, you can't make it out your driveway without bumping into God. You can't work an hour of your day without bumping into God. He hides himself where he can be found. Why does he do this? What's another reason to do this? Because, because Christian maturity, Christian understanding is to realize that this is so, that God has hidden himself in order to be found so that no one may boast. So no one can brag to them, you know, brag to people like, Oh, you know, I went to, I found a book in the Barnes and Noble's religious section and I read it and I figured it all out for myself, right? That's, that's not how it works. That's not how it works, right? We don't come up with the kingdom idea. It's God's initiative. God's prior action buried it in the field for us to find. We don't manufacture pearls. God puts pearls in our way. It's God's initiative so that we may truly recognize the life of the kingdom as a gift and not an insight that we somehow came up with or discovered. Which brings us to St. Paul, who has been arguing this very point for the last eight chapters of Romans that we've been reading this summer. And I say we instead of you to make sure that you're, you know I'm speaking to the church and not to each of you as an individual which is precisely how Paul speaks to the Romans. Paul says, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And see, the problem in Western Christianity, especially the American evangelical brand, which dominates American religious discourse, we understand the those who, whom he predestined to be a series of individuals. But the those whom he foreknew and predestined do not equal a series of individuals, but are a people. It's a group. But you lot, whom he foreknew, right? It's the y'all of scripture. It ta it's talking about a people that God foreknew and predestined to be his people. He created a people to be his people. The people of Messiah Jesus. To be predestined is God's prior action of forming the people. And so often this gets heard, especially by Americans, remember, and has, we hear predestination as in a forensic setting, which is a fancy way of saying a courtroom setting. And so we hear predestination as saying, like, basically, God has already written guilty or not guilty on the verdict sheet, right? And we're just kind of getting processed. And you might ask, friends, you might ask, gentle reader, you might ask yourself, why would God go through the trouble, right? I mean, if he's already written guilty, not guilty, why do the trial in the first place? And this is indeed a problem of some forms of evangelicalism. Like, why would God go through the whole cross thing in the first place then, right? He could just decide, guilty, not guilty. And, by the way, why doesn't God then just give us the ability to be not guilty <laughs> if he's going to declare us not guilty, well, here's the deal. Forget the forensic setting for a moment. Forget the courtroom drama and try a dinner party setting instead. Right? Rather, a banquet setting. In a culture in which meals make a family. To be invited to a banquet, to dine with someone, is to become kin with them in Jesus' culture. And so to where a banquet makes a family, God knows in a, in a, whom he's invited to the meal. He knows he's going to have a meal. 
That's the whole point of his outpouring of love into the creation is to create a human family. So that, as Paul says, Jesus would be the firstborn of a large family. That's the whole point. That's the point of creation, that Jesus would be the firstborn of a massive family of human beings. Right? So God is the, the, the dinner party, God's idea, God's initiative. Right? So it's like, let's, let's map this out. Is this a human thing or a God thing? Dinner party, God thing. Right? Who's paying for the food? That'd be a God thing. Right? God did that. Those whom he predestined, those whom he already knew he was going to invite, which is everybody, and those whom he predestined, then he called. And so a call, right? When, you call, when someone calls you, did you take, I mean, the whole point is, if you, has someone ever answered the phone and said, uh, why'd you, you know, um, and, you know, basically pretending like they're the ones who called you instead of, anyway. Well, it's silly. When you get a call, it's the other person's initiative, right? They called you. You're picking up the phone, right? The call for Paul is the effect of God's grace on an individual, right? It's God's initiative. To be justified means that when you show up to the party and the other guests might be able to point out reasons why you shouldn't be at the party, Jesus says, yeah, he's in. That's justification, right? It's, it's to say, it's when you get to the party, Jesus says, you belong at the party. You made the right decision to get in your car and get here, right? That's, that's what justification is, right? It's, and living in the confidence of that means you get in your car because you know Jesus is going to back you up despite your disqualifications, that Jesus will back you up at the door. That's what living in trust, living in faith in justification means. You have trust that God invited you for a reason. To be glorified <coughs> is to be given a seat. Assigned to you by whom? God. A seat of honor and fed the food of the banquet. God's own son, Jesus. The whole, our part in this whole thing is to choose to come. Is to choose to come. To get in our car and go. To get in our feet. To walk if we have to and get there. And see, the life of grace is the comfort, the joy of knowing that if you get a flat tire on your way to the banquet, God will send a car. He'll, he'll get you there. All you have to do is want to be there. And he will do everything else. That's grace. That's God's prior love. And the kicker is, here's the problem. You also have to be willing to dine with others. That, that's part of the deal. You have to be willing to dine with others. It's a group thing. God's people is a group thing. Right? And then, once we're there, and when we've been fed, we begin to share in the feast by be going from guests to staff and feeding others through our own suffering love, which is what it means to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what that means, is to begin to imitate the one who invited us and become a servant instead of a guest. That's the journey of Christian maturity. God wants you there. He has already paid everything required for you to be there. He has sought you out. He's made sure that the invitation got to the right person and it's you. He has done everything. All you have to do, <coughs> all you have to do is open the invitation and set out and God will get you the rest of the way. For God's love is prior to ours. And his work is to bring us into his people. Amen.